Our reading from the scriptures comes from the gospel narrative of Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. It is found in verses 33 through 39, from 33 to the end of the chapter. Let's start to read at verse 18. Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop. And let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts, whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said unto him, And here's where our text begins. Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them. No man putteth a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish." But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. We stop in our reading of the scriptures at that point, praying God's blessing of it to us. The text that God gives us tonight is found in Luke 5, verses 33 through 39. We don't know what motivated the question 
that was asked of Jesus in verse 33. Whether it was just a sincere question, honestly looking for an explanation for the difference between the way in which the Pharisees and the scribes conducted themselves over, I'm sorry, the way the disciples of the Pharisees and John the Baptist conducted themselves and the way in which Jesus' disciples did. It would seem not because the Pharisees and scribes as teachers of the law would have known about fasting. But regardless of what the motive was, what we want to leave with and learn is this. That there is every reason for us to know joy. That the coming of Jesus Christ as our Savior and then as our Lord is a reason not for us to be afraid but reason for us to have the greatest joy. And that's what we will consider and look at as we go through this incident in the life of Christ. It's a time to feast, not fast. The issue is what we want to look at first, and that has to do with the whole concept of fasting. Then secondly, we want to look at the explanation that Jesus gives for why his disciples didn't fast. And then finally, we consider the implications of that for us as we seek to apply it. But first, fasting, that was the subject. A fast is when, for a period of time, one does not eat or drink, especially alcohol. It's a time which, as a fast, is a time of earnest prayer, sincere humility and sorrow, deep sorrow. There was one time, according to the ceremonial law, that God commanded there to be fasting. And that was on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 26, or 23, 16 and 23, 16 and 23, state the rules and for, for the time of fasting that had to characterize the Day of Atonement. That there was only one time that fasting was commanded does not mean that the other times of fasting were prohibited but that fasting on that one day, one feast day, the Day of Atonement, was to give the expression of what kind of fasting is real and genuine. But the scriptures speak and record other times of fasting. When the tribe of Benjamin was allowing for the man who worshipped idols then the other tribes came together to do battle against the Benjamites. And the first time they went to battle with them, after seeking God's will that they do it, they were defeated. That stunned them. God told them to do it. Why wouldn't they expect a victory? And that was, according to Judges 20, an occasion for them to fast and pray. Lord, Ought we to go against our brethren, the Benjamites? They fasted on that occasion. 
there was the fasting for seven days by the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead when, De when Saul killed himself in that battle with the Philistines. His death was the occasion for them not only to rescue his body and that of his sons and save the embarrassment of the nation, but it was also an occasion for them in their sorrow over the death of Saul to have seven days of fasting. Deuteronomy 9 presents a historical occasion where there was fasting because of, to express repentance. Ezra, in Ezra chapter 8, ordered a time of fasting because they were so earnest and wanted to be so earnest in seeking God's blessing. Zechariah chapter 7 records an unusual expression of fasting in the fifth and seventh months. In Jesus' parable about the Pharisee and the publican praying in the temple, the Pharisee declared that he fasted twice a week. So fastings are recorded. The, 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 the difficulty, of course, is this. What makes for genuine fasting? And then we have to realize this. Fasting may not ever be seen as an end in itself. If I fast, don't eat, then I'm doing what's right. Fasting is not an end in itself. It may not be that. Is it a means to an end? I'm going to fast, and that's going to help me be more spiritual. That seems to have played a role in why God commanded it for the Day of Atonement. But we have to be very careful. Sincere, true fasting, like sincere, true sacrificing, all the sacrifices commanded in the Old Dispensation, sincere and genuine worship, going to church are things which in themselves have no godliness about them. They're just external activities. They are what the Apostle Paul says, exercising ourselves bodily. They're simply bodily exercises. They profit a little. The things, the activities. True fasting is rather something that is occurs almost spontaneously because one's mind is so filled with an earnest expression of sorrow or humility or seeking of God that you don't even think about eating. You're so focused on something else. You're so earnest in the seeking of God that the earthly and earthly time passes by without your really noticing and appreciating. When Jesus condemned the Pharisees for their fasting, it was because they wanted to be seen. And so, while people couldn't see whether they ate or not, they would do whatever they could to make up their faces so that they would look glum and unsightly. True, true worship. True fasting. Remember, again, just a quick review, is not in itself something that God requires and is not in itself an activity of worship. 
it's something that results because the heart and the mind are in the right place, so occupied that the not eating takes place. John's disciples fasted, the Pharisees said. There's no reason for us to doubt the truth of that. The suggestions have been that John's disciples fasted because he was imprisoned and they were pleading with God to have him released or to have him kept safe in the prison. Others suggest that John's disciples fasted because they were mourning the death of John the Baptist. But it's also possible that just as John characterized the whole of his ministry with an outward look that called the people to godly sorrow. His baptism was that unto repentance. He sought to call the attention of those who were on their way to Jerusalem to be involved in all of the Phariseistic external worship and to bring them to a sincerity. So we read that Jesus said of John himself that John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, he hath a devil. John, Luke 7, verse 33. And his disciples might have followed that example of John of not eating bread nor drinking wine. But the purpose of that was the same purpose that John had for preaching in the wilderness, not in Jerusalem, being dressed in the clothing that everybody identified as that of like Elijah, so that his witness as well as his speech, his physical appearance as well as his speech, would be that which called the people to a sincerity that was lacking in Jerusalem, a sincerity in worship. The Pharisees were deceitful when they sought to identify the fasting of John's disciples with the fasting of their disciples. There is no reason for us to doubt the sincerity and the genuineness of the fasting characterized by John and his disciples. But Jesus makes it plain that the fasting of the Pharisees was merely external, merely a show. And so when they came to Jesus with this question, and they took John's disciples and their disciples and say, Look, we fast. They were exercising what is not an uncommon tool of the devil, to bring about a quarrel and a division. The devil wants us especially arguing about outward practices. The devil does anything he can to make us forget to love one another, forget that brotherly love that God commands so frequently in the scriptures. And if we can have an issue that we're going to be divided about, the devil's right there. He's pushing that agenda. Bring about division. So that many times we think that the solution to that is to make a rule and make a law. But no rule and no law really solves anything. And it's forgetting that holiness and obedience are voluntary activities of love. Holiness and obedience are voluntary acts that result from loving God.
the devil wanted a division. They fast. Your disciples don't. Why we might think that the Pharisees, when they came to Jesus with this question about why his disciples didn't fast, is striking because they knew the law. They were the ones who gave answer to Herod when the wise men came and said and asked, where is the king of the Jews to be born? They knew Bethlehem of Judea, Micah 5, verse 2. They gave the answer. They, as good students of the Scripture, were aware that only one fast was required according to God's ceremonial law. And they should have known, and we must know, that it's not fasting, it's not sacrificing, it's not going to church, that God demands. And we take just a moment to be reminded of that from the prophets. Jesus quoted this passage from Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. I desired mercy, not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I desire mercy rather than sacrifice. It makes us remember what Samuel said to David. Sacrifice. That doesn't do it. Obedience. Hearkening. To hearken is better than the fat of rams. Obedience comes and is evidenced not in those external activities. Isaiah 58. God asks a rhetorical question in verse 6. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? You want to know what fasting really is? It's to loose the bands of wickedness to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Mercy. So Micah 6. What doth the Lord require? Sacrifices, rivers of oil, the fruit of my womb for the sins of my body? No, love, mercy. Do justly, walk humbly with thy God. Jesus explanation to the question why do your disciples feast and not fast is this verse 34 can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them For 4,000 years, 4,000 years, the genuine people of God were waiting for the Messiah to come. 4,000 years. They were eager in their anticipation. They kept waiting and waiting and waiting. He came. 
And Jesus says rhetorically, and you expect not only the children of the bride chamber, but the bride to perform acts of mourning and earnest beseeching when the promise is realized? The figure of speech that Jesus uses is that with which we're all familiar. He's the bridegroom. He made a promise to the bride that he would come and take her in marriage, but he had to prepare the place where they would live first. He's committed to her. He's going to marry her. But he's got things he has to get ready first. And she's waiting. And those who love the bridegroom and the bride are waiting expectantly for that. So we talk about the return of Christ in this sort of language, just like Jesus did. He's the bridegroom. He's coming. And then we talk about heaven as being, and that's sometimes often heard in the prayers at our wedding receptions, heaven will be an unending wedding feast, celebrating joyfully the coming of, of the bridegroom and the marriage. The children of the bride chamber were not so much the parents who had the responsibility, but those friends, those friends of the bride and of the groom, especially of the groom, whose responsibility was to keep the festivities going. Continue the exercise of great joy and festivity with music and other gala presentations so that they and the people there would have joy, not sorrow, and express their joy. Jesus, when he comes and says, Now I'm here, I came, I've arrived, and now I'm with them. Have you ever been to a wedding and in the reception seen somebody, or at the time of the wedding, walk out in tears? It's such a marked contrast and it seems so inappropriate. And we really, we we quickly try to figure out why sorrow at a time of such joy. To those in the true church of Christ who have been anticipating his coming with such eager anticipation so that it didn't matter what time of the night it was that the, that the young shepherds came to their homes after they had been to the manger scene and then before they went back to their flocks, They stopped everywhere they could in that vicinity and told the people they knew who were watching and waiting about the coming of the Messiah. They had gotten the news of great joy, which should be to all people. It's a time of joy when salvation is realized. Then mourning and weeping has ended because we know that there is forgiveness. Then we experience the Psalm 89. That that was why we sang 241. That first stanza. The coming of the Messiah for God's people who only sin, not good enough, not earning His coming by their works, but who know what it is to be saved, forgiven and made righteous, is that they rejoice at the mercies of God. So I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing of them. And with my mouth will I make known all those mercies put together, His faithfulness. Now Jesus notes in verse 35 that that the time will come when 
his disciples will have to fast. And there is an anticipation that he gives to them of the fact that he is going to leave them for a while. And that's what takes up the conversation in the upper room because he had told them he was going to be taken away in captive and be killed. And they, let not your hearts be troubled. They were confused and they knew what it was to be troubled. But John 16, in John 16, Jesus declares that it's only going to be for a little while. But the emphasis, the emphatic emphasis of Christ is this. This is a time of joy. Now listen to other parts of Scripture. We quoted the angels in Luke 2, verse 10. When the disciples in the upper room feared the departure of Christ, Jesus says in John 15, verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. In John 16, verse 24, Hitherto have ye asked, nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. In his prayer of John 17, Jesus says in verse 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled, fulfilled in themselves. I want my joy fulfilled in them. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You can hear that quote in that part of the Lord's Supper form. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And that's why the feast day of atonement was finished. No more fasting. No more reason for fasting. Because the consciousness that we received, the the atonement of Christ, is a reason for us to have Joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul continues at the end of Romans in chapter 15, verse 13. He says this, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy in peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Then you have those words from 1 Peter 1. You're begotten again by a lively hope unto the re- by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away. And it's reserved in heaven for you, you who are kept by the power of God, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. But then he finishes it this way. Whom, having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So Jesus says, to fast now when I'm here, when I'm with them, when I've realized salvation 
when I fulfilled every commandment of God for your sakes, when in me you are not only sinless, without fault before him, but you're righteous, rejoice. Rejoice. To prove it, Jesus uses two parables. That of a patch on a cloth garment and that of new wine in wineskins. The ideas of those are these. When I was young, then we always wore blue jeans. But while we began the school year with nice new blue jeans, it didn't take long through the course of the year, depending on how, how roughly we played, because we didn't get the holes in the knees in the classroom. But there would be patches that mothers would put on the blue jeans on the knees. They didn't make blue jeans with uh, already made holes in them then. But there would be a patch. Early, they would do the patches by sewing them on there. Later on, they had the iron-on patches. That was a real advance in technology. But the idea of the patches was very familiar to all of the listeners of Christ. And if you took a piece of cloth that had been newly made, and it was made out of animal hair, cotton, linen, or hemp, then you sewed it on and it looked great. But when you would wash it, that brand new piece of cloth would shrink. The rest had already shrunk, but now that new one would shrink. And when it would shrink, it would, by the shrinking, tear away itself from the good cloth that was around it. And so the wor you would end up with something worse than what you began with. That was not a solution. The other figure is that of wine. If you newly make wine, then you know that it needs to sit a while. It needs to ferment. Otherwise, it's just grape juice. So the yeast and the sugar goes in. Now today, we put it in hardened vessels, barrels, or aluminum cans and containers. Then they would put them in animal skins. And as the fermentation took place in that locked-in animal skin, it would expand. The same thing that you have if you take a bottle of milk and you put it in the freezer. And you don't take some off the top first, but you put it in the freezer full. It expands. And it, when it expands, you can end up with a mess. When the wine would ferment and expand inside that wineskin, if it was an old wineskin, already stretched, it would break it and everything would be spilled and you'd lose the wineskin. If you had new wine, you wanted to put it in a new wineskin because that skin would expand. It wasn't old and finished expanding yet. That's the picture that Jesus uses. It is inappropriate to put a kind of cloth as a patch on a hole, on old jeans or old piece of cloth, when it still has to shrink. It's inappropriate to do that. It's inappropriate to put new wine in old wineskins. Those are two, obviously, to the people of that day, inappropriate activities. It is just as inappropriate for the disciples of Jesus to fast and to mourn 
when He's with them, when He has come. Now let's recognize this. The joy of salvation never takes away the reality of godly sorrow. There is always the place for genuine humility and godly sorrow on those who are sinners. But it's almost this way, and we've drawn this similarity in comparison before. The amount of that genuine sorrow is going to determine the amount of true godly joy. If my sorrow is for a few, then my joy is going to be comparable. But God wants us to learn this, that as those who are the children of God, who now take this morning, who have the privilege, the right, to look at that almighty, holy God who created all things and call Him Father, And rejoice in the caring and loving relationship that that name means. That we never forget that. And that that moderates the times of sorrow in the cases of death. It moderates the kind of joy that we have when when we're happy because of some sport activity or some, even a wedding. Our joy is settled. Our joy is maintained. It's always there. And and Jesus, notice how often in those expressions that we read, He wants our joy to be full. Sorrow for sin, yes. But a sorrow answered often quickly with the knowledge that we're forgiven and we're declared righteous. To stay fasting, to have one continuous time of sorrow is inappropriate for God's people. It's wrong. And so we've been looking at and we plan to continue to look at some of the miracles that Jesus performs in the course of his ministry. He brings healing to the sick. Just let them let him touch them. He brought liberation to those that were imprisoned by demons. He brought freedom from care to those that were care ridden. He brought cleansing to lepers, sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, food to the hungry, and the lame walk. And all of those miracles were instructions that Jesus gave that the physical healings loudly and joyfully proclaimed to the sinners, you're forgiven and you're righteous in Christ. To maintain the old, we're still longing, is to indicate a misunderstanding and an ignorance The Feast of Atonement is fulfilled and it is no more. Salvation is come. It's ours. Therefore, when we weep, we, we weep as those with hope. When we hurt, then we know what we can't see or feel yet that our God is going to work it good. Good is going to come out of this. It doesn't, it doesn't allow sin. It doesn't say we may sin. But it always tells us the chief characteristic of a child of God is to be one of joy. He's here. He's coming again. He's with you. 
So to mourn and to weep when we're told that we're free from sin and the bondage of sin would be inappropriate. It would be like having a tremendous feast and nobody talks and everybody's wiping their eyes and blowing their noses. The wine of salvation is to be received with thanksgiving and a spontaneous effort of service to thank Him who loved us so much first. Amen. Our Father, we thank Thee for what Thou hast done for us in Jesus Christ. And that's reason for us to be happy, blessed, and to realize the great joy that's ours in Christ. And we even sing that, what a day that will be when he comes again. While our joy is yet moderated, may the knowledge of what Christ has done for us and that he's with us and the marriage is certain never leave us. May the devil, through all of his efforts, always be answered. Christ said, it is finished. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.